John Tyler was our 10th president. And probably you wouldn't have known John Tyler at all. Just like, you know, name me 15 vice presidents, right? Be a pretty hard thing for you to do. And that would have been John Tyler too, if it hadn't been for the fact that his elderly running mate, William Henry Harrison, uh, caught pneumonia and then got pleurisy and died 31 days into his administration. And John Tyler became the first vice president that became president. Uh, we have it all figured out now. Of course, there was the uh, 25th Amendment or whatever it was that was passed to kind of make sure that all of this was figured out. But back in the, uh, the early 19th century, they didn't know how they were going to do all this. They weren't sure if their vice president should just assume the powers of the presidency or actually become the president. And uh, in, in some of the people, even in Tyler's own party um, and in William Henry Harrison's cabinet, really didn't like this idea that John Tyler would be the next president. They were hoping that Henry Clay or somebody else would. They started referring to John Tyler as his accidency because he wasn't meant to be the, pre the president. He just kind of got that uh, position. And uh, soon his whole party and, of course, the opposing party totally turned against John Tyler. Um, they brought against him articles of impeachment. Um, though um, Johnson was the first to be impeached, uh, Tyler was the first one that they brought articles of impeachment against. They rejected his cabinet members, which is the first time that it ever happened in, in the young U.S. Uh, history. They rejected his judicial appointees. And John Tyler just had this fight his whole life with Everybody. I mean, it wasn't just a Republican Democrat. It was, he was a part of the Whig Party, and the Whig Party didn't even want him. And of course, the other side didn't want to play ball either. He uh, started then, in, after, after his term was done and was running for election, uh, both parties elected somebody else. He tried to get his own platform together, but fizzled out and left the presidency. Actually, ended up join, joining the Confederacy. And uh, so when he died, he was one of the few presidents that didn't get any kind of burial honors in Washington, D.C., because at the time in 1962, the Civil War was going on and he had allied himself with the Confederacy. So you think, you know, as much as we look at uh, presidents, recent presidents that have been embroiled and it seems like everybody's against them and even weaponizing the Justice Department against them, it's in some ways it's happened to many other presidents before, including and especially John Tyler, first of all. And I use that as an illustration to talk about the fact that we're living in a, in a world where there's going to be conflict against you. And even the people that you thought were going to be your friends and the people that allied with you uh, sometimes will turn against you. And I hope you never find that to be the case here at First Baptist Church. I hope that you understand this is not an organization. It's a family. It's the body of Christ. And uh, there is there's not only a mechanism for reconciling, but there is the impetus through the Holy Spirit of God for us to love one another and to be on the same page. And we try to do that as much as we can in our business meetings, in our, in our dealings with one another. If I, as a pastor, hear that two people aren't getting along very well, I want to make sure that I can do whatever it takes to reconcile those people. So that's a part of it. So hopefully you won't find that here in the church, but understand that it does happen. It happens in your family. It happens in your workplace. It happens in maybe your community. Um, it's going to happen that people are going to be against you. And in 1 Samuel 19, the person that's against David is actually his father-in-law and his boss and his king. So <laughs> you've got all three dynamics involved in this conflict with Saul and David. So let's read verse 11 and go through verse 17. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning and Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Michael had a little hint of what was going on. Jonathan didn't remember, but Michael did. And she says, David, you got to do something. You've got to escape. You can't go out the front door. And so in verse number 12, Michael let David down through the window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth and when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, why hast thou so deceived me and sent my, away mine enemy that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, he said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? 
We talked about Michael's wrong response last week. We're not really going to delve very much more into this passage. It sort of speaks for itself. Saul initially uh, was friends with David, was glad for David when David was fighting the battles. But as soon as people started recognizing that David was getting a lot more done than Saul was, and that God was with David and maybe not Saul, and the people started singing that David, or Saul rather, started to eye David and become very suspicious of him, specifically that he would take the throne. He tried, first of all, to kill David by sending him off on what he thought would be suicide missions. You know, go fight the Philistines, and David would come back victorious. You know, go kill 100 Philistines, and uh, David brings back, you know, the evidence that he's killed 200 Philistines. And so God is with David, but he tries, first of all, to kill him uh, via Philistine. And then he suggests in verse 1 to his servants and his son that someone should take care of David. It's my intention to kill David. And I don't know how he said it. If he just said, boy, it would be sure great if somebody just, if, if David had an accident, you know, wink, wink. Wouldn't it be great if David just sort of disappeared? If he, you know, fell off an embattlement or, uh, you know, a, an errant arrow in the midst of battle or something, something, just something that would happen to him. And that didn't happen either. David, Jonathan intervened. And so now Saul says, I'm going to send assassins to his house to watch his door. And when he comes out, we'll kill him. Now Saul isn't thinking about how he'd cover that up or what the, the optics of that. He's not thinking about any of that. He's laser focused on sinning against David. And uh, it, it's so much so that even in verse 15, you know, he hears that David's sick and he's like, bring him to me in his bed so that I can kill him right now. I mean, Saul's off the rails, right? We, we've gone just completely uh, crazy. And what can David do about it? Essentially nothing, right? He, 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 can't, he can't fight Saul. He's the king. He, he doesn't want to split the whole country in half. He doesn't feel like that's right. Obviously, David got away. And when he got away, in reflecting on this, he wrote Psalm 59, which is where we're going. Psalm 59 go back there again. Russ read it for you already, and so we won't read it all at once, but we will read it little piece by piece. Look at the beginning here of Psalm 59. In my Bible, and probably in yours, it says right under Psalm 59, to the chief musician, Altacheth, Miktam of David, when Saul sent, and they watched the house to kill him. The, you don't always get an occasion of the writing of this psalm as we're studying psalms on Wednesday nights. We say, what's the occasion? Sometimes we can say, others we can't. You know, when we get to David sinning with Bathsheba, we're going to look at Psalm 51 because that was written after Nathan confronted him and he confessed his sin. When Saul was in a cave, uh, when, when Saul came into the cave, he wrote a psalm. When David was out in the wilderness, he wrote a psalm. And so over and over again, these psalms give us a little bit of a glimpse as to what David was thinking after X happened. And in this case, after Saul sent people to his house to watch him so that they could kill him, David wrote Psalm 59. Now, we understand, because the Bible says so, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Meaning, all of it is for us in some way. Now, not to the same extent as other people, maybe. When we read the Old Testament law, Exodus, Leviticus, it doesn't have quite the same thing, meaning, as the people that first heard it. Because we understand the fulfillment in Christ, we understand that Christ fulfilled the law for us, and so you do have to look at it with a different view. But when Paul said scripture is profitable, he was talking about Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all those books that we think, oh, I need to just skip this. Who cares about don't eat vultures and, and what happens if you have a weird scab? You know, like, I'm just going to go over that. Well, some of those are a little harder to get the profit from, but it is at least profitable. So let's, how, do we, how do we do this when we're looking at stories? Because let's be... Let's admit that the way that David lived his life back in, listen, 1000 BC, <laughs> and here we are now, over 3000 years later, we're living very different lives. We're in a different setting. When David talks about um, rock formations, we don't really have those around here, you know, but he didn't maybe know what pine trees were. He didn't know what smartphones were. He didn't know what uh, technology, he didn't, you couldn't explain electricity to David, right? You just couldn't. 
But there's a lot of stuff he knew that we just don't have an understanding, but he's the one that wrote the Bible. We didn't. So we're trying to understand where he is, and we're trying to put our understanding into what he was doing because the Bible says it's profitable. Do you understand what I'm saying? You understand? You'll get, so what I'm saying is this, that God says this is good for you, and you say, but I don't understand how that can be profitable for me. So that, this is where the Bible student, the lover of God's word, says, Holy Spirit of God, teach me how I can apply these principles to my own life. Now, again, our culture and experiences are just different. It would be interesting. It would be great to know what Joseph would have done with a smartphone, what Elisha was like as a driver. Did he ever, I mean, if there's anybody who probably had road rage, it was Elisha, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, it would have been interesting to see how Peter used social media. And so we're just, we're, it would be great if we had those. We don't have those, but we do have principles that we can glean from God's word. So we have questions that we're trying to answer as we are trying to profit from God's word. Questions like, when we read about enemies, who are our enemies? Like, I don't have the same enemies that David does. To my knowledge, there's no, been no one at my house trying to kill me. And my father-in-law hasn't sent them. So do we just like, do we just like, well, this doesn't apply to me, and so I just move. Well, but the Bible says it's profitable, right? So you got to find something, some kind of commonality that the Holy Spirit of God wants to, he put it here for a reason, right? There's all kinds of stuff that wasn't put in the Bible. God chose, put this in here, so what do we do with it? That's the question. Who are our enemies? And and as you're thinking about this message, who are your enemies? Who are the people that you would consider your enemies? It's going to be a little different than it was for David, but maybe you have some. Maybe it's someone that you know. Maybe it's spiritual wickedness in high places. Whatever it is, that's the category. That's what we're going to talk about today, your enemies. And I think it's just good for you to have a, a working definition, maybe a face of who your enemy is. But second, how do our experiences differ? Again, even, even in just thinking, I don't have enemies the same way David does. I don't, I don't have people stalking my house. So how do we, how do we deal with it? Like, I don't, I'm not going to be in that situation, maybe, where someone is watching my house to kill me. Maybe, maybe you are. But how do, how do you deal with this? Three, uh, how do we mix the Psalms that very much give voice to what we would call, the fancy word is imprecatory Psalms. So there's one way to say, I'm praying for you, meaning I'm praying that God would help you. And then you, when you say, I'm praying for you, sometimes we mean the way that David prayed. I'm praying that you would melt like a slug, you know, <laughs> that God would just demolish you. I pray that he would destroy you. And we would say, you know, my understanding from a New Testament perspective is that we're supposed to love our enemies, <laughs> pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us, uh, bless them that, that curse us and curse not, and we read David, and we're like, I don't, I don't think he really understood the New Testament like I do, and that's true. They're not, in contradict they're not in contradiction. David was dealing with national Israel. We're not dealing with national anything. We as a Christian people are not a nation. America, uh, we're living in America, but America isn't really our true nation. Our true allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom, and so it's a totally different paradigm, right? And so how do we, how do we mix that over? How do we transfer that over? And then can we then derive principles that are similar to our daily life? One of the ways we can do this is by using a greater to lesser argument. Um, in the Latin, for those of you who care, and I'm talking mostly to Zach and Seth, um, a fortiori, or argumentum a major minus. That's a lesser from a, a, great, a greater to lesser argument. Now, Jesus used this in parables, right? He said, all right, suppose that there's a guy and he owes somebody money and, uh, and he owes the king, you know, trillions of dollars and he says, I'll pay it back. And, and, uh, the, and God says, and the king says, I'll forgive you. And then that man goes out and finds somebody else and says, you pay me what you owe. And when the man doesn't, he puts him into prison. And the idea is if, if you have been forgiven much, you should forgive the little. So there's all kinds of this in the Bible where God says, you know, if, if a shepherd would go out and find one sheep, how much more precious are you to God? So there's this argument. So if, if what we're reading about in David's life is true, then how much more true for us in the New Testament era where we're supposed to love our enemies? What are some things that principles that we can pick up from what David says in trusting the Lord and his perspective that we can apply to our lives, even if it's not the same scenario? 
even if it's not ever going to be the exact same thing, how can we take principles from it so that we can get the profit that's from God's word? All right, so let's first of all look at the description of these enemies uh, in verses uh, 1 through 7. He says, deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered together against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold, look, look at what's going on, God, look. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors, Selah. They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouths. Swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? All right, so we have a description. I, I, I saw at least eight descriptions. First of all, there are people that rise up against us. Who are your enemies? People that would rise up against you. People that are devising or plotting against you. Saul had a plan of how to kill David. He sent people to go watch, and maybe he even said, you know what to do when you see him. You know, hide in the bush, and when he comes out, shoot an arrow, get a sword, make sure there's a lot of you because he's a good fighter. You know, whatever it was, there was a plan. He was devising this. It wasn't just like, oh, man, I wish somebody would take care of him and then finds out later that it happened. That happens later with David where he, um, he has people come to him and said, well, we killed Ishbosheth. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, the king, uh, king Saul's other son, we killed him for you. And David's like, that's not what I wanted. Like, like that, that's the wrong thing to do. We'll talk about that story later. But that's not what hap is happening here. Saul is actually actively planning against him. Our enemies may plot to undermine us at work, in our community, uh, in our family. Uh, things might be hard. They might be trying to make things hard for us. And uh, maybe that's your enemy, people that are plotting against you too. They're focused on sin. In verse number two, he calls them the workers of iniquity and bloody men. And again, this is true of Saul. All he can think about is hatred and murder. All he can think about is power and getting his own throne and keeping it. If he has to kill his son-in-law, the hero of Israel to do it, then he will do it. And many people in our lives, your coworkers, your family members, they're not living in the same paradigm as you are. They're not living from a grid of what does the Bible say and what would please the Lord to do? <laughs> How do I order my life in a way that would reflect Jesus Christ? They're not thinking that at all. They're thinking in terms of self and me and what can I get and how can I make myself happy? And, and just understand, they live in a paradigm of selfishness and getting what you can while you can. In verses 3 and 4, he says they're, they're, they're people that go after innocent people. David had done nothing wrong. He says, not for my transgression. I haven't done anything to David or to Saul. I understand if I'd broken the law or if I'd insulted Saul in some way, but I haven't done anything wrong. And he says, God, you see this, that I haven't done anything wrong, but this is the kind of enemy we're talking about. You haven't done anything wrong. You don't have anything to confess. You can't go to them and say, I'm sorry for what I did because you didn't do anything wrong. And just understand that people are still going to be against you. Sometimes that happens. It just doesn't matter to them whether you've done the right thing or not. They're focused on themselves. Four, they're acting like heathen. And in verse number five, he says, awake to visit all the heathen. Now, when we say heathen, we have kind of a different view of that, right? So etymologically, the word heathen are people that live in the heath or way out there, right? <laughs> People that live um, out, and so they're going to be more of a tribal ancestor worship kind of uh, religion. And so the heathen are the people that don't worship God. They're worshiping spirits. They're worshiping animism. They're worshiping something else. That's what he means. But it, the idea here, the heathen, is just it's the nations. It's the people that are Gentiles. It's the people that are out there. And he says, Saul, that's, that's what you're acting like. God, you see Saul, he's acting, like an, he's acting like an unbelieving king who can just kill whoever he wants because he doesn't like him. Now, this is what Israel wanted, make us a king like all the nations, and now they've got it. Vindicative, selfish, angry, this is what they have. He's acting like an unbeliever. Should we be surprised when unbelievers act like unbelievers? Should we be shocked when people are like, what do you mean you're not following the Bible? <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm not a believer, you know, they, they, and maybe even sometimes they think they are, but it's not surprising when they don't, right? 
Number uh, five, they are aimless, bent only on destruction. In verse number six, he compares them to dogs roaming the city. Uh, we in 21st century America think of dogs, for some people, as very cute, wonderful little things that are a big part of our life, even part of our family, and we don't look at me, Donna. And we, uh, <laughs> and, and we, 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 you know, we take pictures of them, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I'm just saying that's not the way David thought about, <laughs> thought about dogs. Dogs for them were like we look at crows and... Uh, you know, things that are picking up dead things by the side of the road. You know, you see a dead deer and you're like, oh, I'm glad there's crows and eagles cleaning that mess up. That's what dogs were. They would just kind of go around the city and they would, they would kind of clean things up. Or, and sometimes if they got too much, then you'd kill a few and just to kind of call the uh, population. And then, and, but it was like just something that was kind of in the background. And being in other countries, you see that all over the place. There are just dogs kind of roaming everywhere. And David's like, this is what they're doing. And Saul is acting just like some aimless dog, kind of going from place to place, kind of sniffing out where he can, trying to look for any kind of opportunity he can to, to come after me. Um, Saul is leaving Israel defenseless. He's not fighting Israel's battles. He's laser focused on killing their, their one hope and hero, David. So he's, he's just, he's acting like a dog. Now, some... Uh, this is, again, our enemies, some who don't think about what they're doing. They're only just seeking what they, they're, they're almost acting on animal instincts. That's who they are. Six is that they're using their words destructively. In the first part of verse seven, behold, they belch out with their mouth. Uh, the word belch just means to gush or to pour forth. Saul is spreading lies about David. Uh, he's, he's slandering him, and he, he's, he's, he's not thinking. He's just talking. Um, and again, this is a, a way that people hurt other people. They just talk. In the multitude of sins, or in the multitude of words, the Bible says, there wanteth not sin. There's going to be, there's going to be that. Um, eight, then they assume that God doesn't see them. At the end of verse number seven, who, say they, doth hear? Uh, who's who's going to call us to be accountable for this? There's no God. There's no God looking over our shoulder. Let's just go with it. Now, again, this eight, these eight descriptions Maybe it's not like Saul for you, but do you have people in your life that are like that or can tend to be like that or you've had this experience? If you have, then we're in David's camp with him. He says, my enemies are people that rise up against me. They're focused on sin. They go after innocent people. They're acting like unbelievers. Their people have no relation to God. They're aimless, bent only on destruction. They use their words destructively. They assume that God doesn't see them. And when we think about that, then we cry out like David, God, do something about this. Like he says in verse number four, awake to help me and behold. He knows, I think fundamentally, that God isn't literally asleep. But when God isn't doing anything, it sure feels like it. So what's going on up in heaven that's so important that you can't help me? And I know some people give God a pass and they say, well, I don't want to pray to God because he's really busy with a lot of other things. He's holding every electron together. Answering your prayer is not a big deal. So, but when he, so that's, and that's worse for us when we think, why isn't he answering this right now? Lord, wake up. And we understand that he's not asleep, but there's at least that frustration in David. You, have you ever felt this? Have you ever felt like, have you ever, you haven't said maybe wake up, God, but you said, what's it going to take? What, what do I have to do to get this answer to prayer? What's the holdup? Have you prayed that? Have you thought that about God? So David is here. Now, again, that's just the frustration because he's thinking about his enemies and he's listed eight things that's wrong with these yahoos. And so now he's saying, Lord, do something about it. But he also then expresses confidence in the Lord. Look at verse number eight. But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. Now, what is David? David knows God intimately. He has gotten to know God in the fields. He's gotten to know God through his word. As you read Psalm 119 over and over again, it says, your word has been my food. Your word has been my light. Your word has been my rock. He's immersed in who God is. And that's so important for us as Christians. When we say, what, is, what should a Christian do? Well, you should go to church. You should read your Bible. You should pray. 
Yeah, okay, that's great. You should also witness. But th those three things, okay, those are good things. But those aren't things that Christians just do. That's the way you get to know God. That's what Christians do. They get to know God. They know God. They have a little bit of his nature in them, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1. And so as we are partakers of the divine nature, we ought to know who God, we can actually know who God is because the, the blinders of sin, is in, are, they're not over us where we can't see God for who he is. Now that we're saved, now that we've been given a new nature, now that we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we can know God in ways that David never could have. So it behooves us even more. You look at David and you say, boy, I wish I could know God like David did. Guess what? You can, if you want to. If you want to put in the time and effort, the fellowship with God, you can know God. And I'm telling you that when you know God intimately, when you know the character of God, that will help with situations like this. When the enemies are X, Y, Z, all those things, knowing God makes all the difference in the world. What does David know about God? In verse number nine, he knows that he is strong. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee. He knows that he is his defense. The word defense here means a cliff or a refuge. It's a, it's a high place. He says, God is my defense, meaning this. God's put me at a high elevation where I'm. the enemies have to come to me. You know, they're talking, they're being like a dog running around the city, but they got to come to me because God's put me on a high place. I have uh, the superior position. I have the high ground. I have the way that, uh, that, that, that I am defended. And that's what he says. In verse number 10, God will prevent me. Now, prevent, we think of God like holding us back. The word actually uh, means to go before. Words have changed in 400 years, and I'm just telling you the word prevent back in 1611 meant to go before. So God will go before me. He's going to scout things out for me. And anything that I encounter, I just know that God knew this was going to happen and planned for it. And it's for my good. And it's for my benefit. And that whatever's happening, God is in it. I don't have to think that God's trying to play catch up. He's already in front of me. God shall prevent me. He's in front of me. He says that God will let him see them fall, that their plans will come to nothing, and that uh, God will vindicate me. And then he says in verse 11, that God is my shield. Nothing will ultimately harm him. Now again, does that mean that Christians never suffer? No. Does that mean that Christians aren't being put to death all over the world? You say, well, how is God your defense if you're being put to death? Um, nothing that God does not in his love and benefit allow can happen to a Christian, right? If something happens to you, it is because God loves you. Honestly, even if it's your fault, you know, you sin and you're reaping some consequence and you say, oh, this is my fault. This isn't God. Well, even those consequences God allowed in and it's always, always for your good. Hebrews 12 says, isn't God a good father? Doesn't he chasten his sons? Isn't it good to be chastened because then you can, you know, get pruned a little bit? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that from the hand of a loving God? Now, if you're sitting here this morning and you say, that's just not the way I see God, that, that every bad thing that happens to me is still a hand of a loving God, then that's the problem. Then you don't know God as well as David and others in the Bible. It's like when you read in Romans 8, 28, um, that, that God works all things for good to them that love him according to his purpose, and you say that's a great verse for the wall, understand it's not a good verse for the wall. It's a good verse for your heart. It's a good verse for your life. And, and it's a good thing to be able to get there to say, yeah, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to go through hard things. But knowing that God is my defense, that he is going before me and behind me and above me and through me, knowing that I can get through the things that I'm getting through. This changes his perspective on what's going to happen. In verses 1 through 7, he's afraid of his enemies. But then he says in verse 8, but. There's a conjunction there, right? We're changing our thought. This, 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 but... If you're talking to somebody and they're like, hey, I think you're great, I think you're wonderful, all these things, but you're like, oh boy, here it comes, right? They're not going to say, but you're also outstanding. You know, It's going to be something on the other side. He's saying that my enemies are bad, it's bad, it's bad, but, and then the good part, but thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. This is nothing for God. And the word derision just means to speak intelli unintelligently, right? It's, it's, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in God's mouth. I'm not trying to be um, anything that, I'm not trying to misrepresent God. But the word derision means that to speak unintelligently. So all the enemies are like, we're going to get him. And, and it's like God is saying, 
That's what the word means, right? That's, their threats are real to me, but to God. <laughs> Saul, I'm going to kill David. Bring him to me in my bed. And, and God loves Saul, but he's also like, that's not going to happen. It, and, then, and David knows that because he knows God. He says, all these things are really hard, but God, you're up there laughing. You are going to make all of this go away. And the, one of the reasons that David knows this is because God has promised he was going to be the king. If God says, I promise that you will be the next king of Israel, then yes, it's a good thing to escape, but understand that God's protecting you and it's going to happen. There's a confidence there. Now, if I'm not saying, you don't have that same maybe confidence. You know, if God somehow impressed upon you, yes, you will live to be 100 years old, then I guess. But probably not, God's not going to give you those kind of promises. But just understand that the more you know God and the more you find his promises, the more you can just go in boldness. And David says, because I know God, I know all of this is going to come to nothing. You guys can plan all you want, but God's going to blow on it, and it'll all go away. So it's important for you to cultivate a relationship with him. There are no wishes here. I wish God would do this. It's all I know who God is. I know that he's a good God. I know he's watching out for me. Then we have a request for help. Now, David's conflicted because Saul is the king, and his boss, and his father-in-law, he can't go kill him, right? That would be just a very, I mean, that's a David thing to do. Well, I'll just go kill him. I mean, every other problem he's had with, a, oh, there's a Philistine contingency. We could go kill him. <laughs> oh, there's a Philistine garrison. You want to go kill him? You know, let's, there's a big giant who's uh, mocking God. I should go kill him. That was just David's, and this one, he can't do that because it's his king, it's his father-in-law, and that's God's man. God put him on the throne, so he can't just go do that. And so David is called, we are called as Christians to love and pray for our enemies. And so David prays for his enemies in a different way that we're supposed to. But there's still some principles here that we can get for ourselves. In verse number 11, he says, slay them not. Now that's an interesting thing, isn't it? You'd think he'd be like, God, could you just kill him and get him out of the way? But he says, Lord, don't, don't kill them. The, the enemies against me, don't kill them. Why? lest my people forget. Don't kill them because then they won't learn the lesson. And it's good for Saul to learn that you're on my side. Now, I don't think Saul ultimately learned that lesson. I don't personally think we're going to see Saul in heaven someday. Um, but uh, the hope was, I hope that, that Saul can learn his lesson. Lord, don't kill him. Now, that's a, that's a merciful prayer to pray for somebody because I'm sure there are people in your life in the past uh, maybe not in your life, you read a, a news article and you say, that, that what happened was so horrible, I wish that person would just die. You've had that thought? I've had that thought. It would be just better for that person to die. Uh, in prison or whatever, whatever, just want them to die. And David, in his worst moments, says, God, don't kill them. I want them to learn of who you are. He says, Lord, but I do want you to scatter them. In verse 11, scatter them by thy power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield. Make it so that their plans fall apart. Humble them so that their lofty plans fall through. He says in verse 12, let them be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Uh, the word taken means to be caught or captured. Let them be apprehended or stopped in all of their full design of what they want to do. God, I've got enemies. They're after me. They want to do these things. Would you just stop them from doing that? Let them be caught in the trap that they're trying to trap from me. In verse 13, consume them in wrath to let them know that God rules. Let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Lord, uh, take care of them in such a way where they would know that it wasn't me, that they're not fighting ultimately against me, they're ultimately fighting against you. And then in, in verse number uh, 14, it's a reflection of verse number six. And verse 14, he says, and at evening, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go around the city. In verse six, he says, that was a bad thing. And in verse 14, he says, let them go back to their doggish ways. Let them just kind of snuff around the city, making a noise and, and aimlessly wandering around. They think they're gonna get an advantage, but Lord, just take away all of that. 
Spurgeon, in his Treasury of David, said this about this. Here, verse 6 is repeated as if the songster defied his foes and reveled in the thought of their futile search, their malice, their disappointment, their rage, their defeated vigilance, their wasted energy. He laughs to think that all the city would know how they were deceived, and all Israel would ring with the story of the image and the goat's hair in the bed. Nothing was more of a subject of oriental merriment than a case in which the crafty are deceived. The warrior poet hears in in fancy, the howl of rage in the counsel of his foes when they found out their victim clean escaped from their hands. <laughs> let, let them howl all they want. I'm, a, I'm safe and I'm in your hands. Um, let them wander up and down for meat, he says in verse 15, and grudge if they be not satisfied. Let them always be searching but never finding. That's David's prayer request. And your prayer request might be something like, God, teach them who you are. Lord, stop them ultimately, and if they won't ever come to know you, then Lord, just stop them from hurting me. But God, I'm putting myself in your hands, and God, I'm, I'm asking you to intervene in, in this situation. Whatever it is, again, spiritual wickedness in high places, someone that you know intimately, wherever on the spectrum you are, to say, God, I just need you to take care of this for me, and I'll do whatever needs to be done. I'll say something if something needs to be said. But I can't tell you, for me personally, how many times I've had where I've just said, God, I don't know what to do about this. I'm willing to do whatever, but God, would you take care of this for me? And he has over and over and over again. Whether it's changing someone's heart, whether it's just changing their plans, making something fall apart, um, God is in the business of answering these kinds of prayers. Uh, he describes the enemies. He expresses his confidence in God. He then makes his request be made known unto God. And what's left? Well, the only thing left to do is to praise God. Read it with me, verses 16 and 17. But I will sing of thy power. You can, read, you can read it out loud with me. Let's start again. But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. God, I will sing of thy power. God, I will sing of thy mercy, thy love. God, I will sing of thy defense. When you know God and you see his working in your life and you've made your request to him, the only thing is to say, God, you're so good, I know that you'll come through for me. And that's exactly what happened here. Next week, we'll look at how David escaped and he went to Samuel. But just for this moment, think about David leaving that house. His father-in-law has sent assassins to kill him. His wife had to let him down out the window and he's escaping. And maybe he's got four different places he can go. He's thinking, where can I go to get away from the assassins where they won't know where I'm at? I can't go to Jonathan's house. I can't go to their house. I can't go to their house. What am I going to do? Maybe I'll go out into the field again. But oh no, Saul saw me out there. And after he finds his place and he's panting and he's thinking, how could this have happened. He writes these words, deliver me oh, from mine enemies, oh my God, defend me from them that rise up against me. And as he's writing, he's pouring out his heart. God, you see what they've done. You know what they're trying to do, but God, I have confidence in you. I know that you'll come through. And God, so hear my requests. And I just praise you for God. And I bet he went to sleep. I bet he just rested the rest of the night knowing that he was safe in the arms of the Lord.